Ok. Buenos días y buenas tardes a todos los participantes y presentadores. Estamos muy felices de estar contigo hoy en el webinar Mundo Post Pandemia, Soluciones Innovadoras Israelíes para Servicios de Agua en la Nueva Normalidad. Good morning and good afternoon to all of our participants and presenters. We're very happy to have you here with us in the webinar Post Pandemic World, Israeli Innovative Solutions for Water Services in the New Normal. Uh, me llamo Ila Cohen Mizrav, trabajo en la División de Agua y Saneamiento. Soy el punto focal focal para la Programa de Innovación Israelí. My name is Ila Cohen Mizrav and I work for the Water and Sanitation Division and the focal point for the Israeli Water Innovation Program. Este webinar será en, es, en inglés y español. Tengan en cuenta que existe una opción de traducción en la Zoom plataforma del inglés al español abajo. Um, I would like to remind you that there's an option of translation from Spanish to English and, and vice versa. You are encouraged to send questions in the chat and we will have a session of questions and answer later in the discussion. We will collect the question and try to address as many as possible. Um, and we will continue answering questions offline if we won't get to all. Um, this session will be divided into three parts. The first will be focused on policy aspect of Israeli water innovation. The second part will be focused on recent technological innovations that are relevant to COVID and post-COVID lives. And we'll hear from four companies in that part. In the third part, we'll be launching a new open call for challenges uh, for water utilities. The selected utilities will receive pilot funded by the bank. You'll hear about this later. Now it's my honor uh, to present Ms. Ada Maria Rodriguez, the Vice President of Sectors and Knowledge for opening remarks. Ana Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ila, thank you, thank you very much. Very impressed by your Spanish. This is great, that means that the bridges are working. I wanted to say hello, bienvenidos, all colleagues and friends, uh, shalom. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us this morning uh, or afternoon for our colleagues in Israel. Thanks to the Israeli Embassy, the Israel Innovation Authority, and Startup Nation Central for all your collaboration and support leading to make this event possible. I wanted to also thank Agustina Guerre, my teacher on the matter, Sergio Campos, Anila Cohen. Uh, you are great protectors of water, and this is a signal of success. So uh, uh, let's go into the matter. I think, I think and everybody knows, Water is life. Thus, protecting water is imperative, and the sense of urgency of this protection is imposed upon us by not only COVID, but the water crisis in large re regions and by the looming effects of climate change. And here we are with Israel, a country that in about 70 years has turned sand into arable land and a desert into a garden. Just think that more than 40% of the country's vegetables and field crops are grown in the desert. 90% uh, of export melons are grown in the Jordan Valley, which is a desert, using mostly treated wastewater. So what was once an island is now home to so fish farms, olive groves, vineyards, date ponds, and including crops like jojoba, uh, widely used in the skincare industry and his of note that Israel has a 50% of the global market share. So Israel has achieved wonders, yes, but not with a magic solution. Israel results are based in hard work, investment, innovation, and respect for nature. As reported recently, and here I quote, Israel could not have made that desert bloom without its incredible innovation in water tech. And that brings us all here to this meeting to share, learn, connect, and expand this innovation to the world at large. We want at the IDB to bring the innovations and innovators from Israel to Latin America and the Caribbean. That is why our partnership with Israel Ministry of Economy, Israel Innovation Authority, and with Startup Nation Central is key because we want to identify relevant technologies that are relevant and useful to Latin America and the Caribbean. Of course, strategic partners are key to achieve transformative change. And we will celebrate today some of the results of that partnership already. Uh, one year ago, we were signing a matching fund agreement with Israel. 
contributing uh, $1 million uh, and for the development and implementation of new technologies and policies to benefit the water sector in our region. And one year after, I'm very proud to report that we were able to develop our first uh, seven pilot projects that are being implemented now in Argentina, uh, two in Mexico, one in, in Brazil, two in Peru, and one in Trinidad and Tobago. Those projects are um, in, uh, to the improvement of water service through beautiful technology to detect water leaks via satellite. And those are being applied in Buenos Aires in Argentina, in Trinidad and Tobago, in Monterrey in Mexico, and in Paraguapebas in Brazil. Other project that we have done with that um, uh, resources and support is the implementation of water event management software in Lima, in Peru. And uh, uh, two things, two studies, of, uh, the study on alternative uh, technologies for water um, recharge of aquifer uh, in Tijuana, Mexico. And that particular one supports the IDV investment, invest, IDV invest water treatment facility investment. And the other study is a prefaciability study on the salination and reuse for the Ancon region in Lima, Peru. So the results are amazing. Not only we started this, but let me mention that from the pilot in Buenos Aires alone, the water savings are estimated in 4.1 million of liters per day. And that secures continuous water services for 24 hours per day for 9,000 people. And that is savings. It was lost before. So I celebrate that Israel trusted the IDB as a partner to open this bridge of collaboration and we deliver based on the trust of our clients, which are the countries. So continuing this journey to identify the specific needs of the region, challenges should open doors for identify specific collaboration opportunities. And that is, we have, that is why today we have set up uh, the IDB7 online, what is called matchmaking meetings, uh, to allow the client utilities to select the most suitable Israel technology to pilot in the company. Because this is about matching technologies and solutions that are relevant for Latin America, the Caribbean, with all its specificities. We're looking forward to expanding our collaboration with Israel to bring more of these innovations that can help us protect water in Latin America and the Caribbean, and in doing so, put water at the service of our citizens. So I think we should start to protect water be better, more efficient, and do it now. We should not wait, as the poet Emily Dickinson said once, that we have to be taught of the need of water by thirst. So thank you very much. Have a spectacular meeting uh, to my colleagues in Israel, Toda Raba. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ana Maria, for your inspiring speech and for being such an important supporter and leader of innovation at the bank. Um, now I would like to ask Ms. Ifat alon Pell to introduce Israel's water sector. Um, Ifat is the Minister of Trade and Economic Affairs at the Israeli Embassy in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much, Hila. Eh, muchas gracias por invitarme. Estimada vicepresidenta Ana María, estimado señor Aguirre y señor Campos, es un placer estar hoy con ustedes y claro que con la gente que de verdad haga la diferencia en el campo de agua, todos ustedes. Eh, estamos orgullosos en esta colaboración que acaba de, de detallar eh, Ana María y por algún tiempo, debo decir sinceramente, hemos buscado la mejor fórmula de co colaboración eh, entre nosotros que aproveche las fuerzas de cada lado. Ahora que lo logramos, esperamos recibir propuestas para proyectos pilotos encima de lo que ya ha detallado Ana María, eh, de todos ustedes, para que podamos elegir los mejores. Y además esperamos que esos pilotos se convierten en proyectos que, para hacer un cambio real. El compromiso de tan alto nivel en el banco, eh, como que se muestra hoy, no lo tomamos eh, eh, por sentado y es también un señal para todos ustedes. Pienso que el banco está tomando el tema en serio. Esta involucración personal que llegó hasta visitas muy técnicas a Israel, a mí me parecía impresionante y es lo que nos podía llevar a ese día cuando tengamos este plan tan bonito que, que ojalá pueda apoyar en enfrentar los desafíos en el campo de agua que todos eh, ustedes enfrenten. Dije que tra trabajamos en encontrar la fórmula exacta, pero la colaboración entre nosotros por sí, era, eso era muy natural por algunas razones. 
El primero es que Israel ha sido un país en desarrollo hasta no mucho tiempo, recibiendo ayudas del Banco Mundial. Así que recordamos y entendemos los desafíos y este proceso de cambio y además sabemos y mostramos de primera mano que ese cambio sea posible. El segundo es que Israel no tiene recursos naturales. Ahora sí hemos descubierto un poco de gas natural, pero eso es bastante nuevo. Lo que trasladaba Israel a otro grupo de países desarrollados es sin duda la filosofía de innovación. Y eso, más que en otros campos, empezaba justo en los sectores de agricultura y agua, que son la base de, de la vida real. Así que no hablamos de milagros, como que dijo bien la vicepresidenta, sino de ser eficaz. El tercer y último punto que hacía la colaboración tan natural es que como un país tan pequeño de 9 millones de habitantes, que casi no es un mercado, empresas israelíes siempre buscan colaborar con empresas extranjeras, desde las primeras etapas de, del desarrollo. Eh, así que cuando se añade a esto la proximidad cultural entre Israel y la región, que los que visitaron a, lo, a los otro, otros lados se eh, pueden confirmar, eso fue muy natural. Ahora, la innovación no existe aislada. Requiere parámetros sociales, pero igual institucionales. Mi colega, el señor Lutón, de la Autoridad de, de Innovación Israelí, va eh, a detallar sobre la política de innovación. Yo quiero mencionar el marco regulatorio en el campo de agua, donde sea, esa innovación se desarrolló y sigue desarrollándose. El primero es que como el gran, país, eh, 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 gran parte del país es desierto, como que dijo la vicepresidenta, el gobierno ha declarado en una ley que se formó en la primera década del Estado de, del Estado de Israel que el agua es recurso público. Encima de eso, hay una sola autoridad eh, que además no es política, eh, quiere decir que no se cambia con el cambio del, los cambios del gobierno, que gobierna y regula todo el tema del agua en el país. Mecorot es la empresa gubernamental de gestión de agua que se formó incluso antes de la creación del Estado Mundial de Israel. Al lado de ella existen cooperativas ciudadanas o provinciales que manejan la distribución de agua. Mecorot y también las grandes de esas cooperativas son también alfa y beta site para tecnologías nuevas. Mecorot misma tiene un centro de innovación e emprendimiento que opera cuatro sitios de I+.D. que cooperan con el resto de, del ecosistema israelí. Pienso que eso también lleva un mensaje que para empujar la innovación propia en el país hay que darle el espacio. De hecho, ustedes pueden ser no solamente los beneficiarios, sino también los facilitadores, creando un círculo virtuoso. Eh, lo último en, para... Eh, eh, hablar sobre este marco es que hace 15 años el gobierno ha dado otro empuje para que más se desarrolle este sector y se creó la agencia NewTek, es acrónimo por eh, Novel Efficient Water Technologies. Es una agencia intergubernamental que se maneja desde el Ministerio de Economía que lleva el papel de eh, innovación y de exportación en Israel. Eso ha generado más emprendimiento y más internacionalización en el sector de agua. Ahora, tras entender los principales del marco institucional, me gustaría mencionar en breve tres detalles que son ejemplos del eh, resultado de todo eso y una razón más, espero, eh, para cooperar con Israel. El primero es que Israel trata casi 90% de sus aguas residuales. Es un número eh, desconocido en, en, en el mundo eh, y eso eh, llega a la, a la agricultura y a la industria. El segundo es que 50% del agua potable en Israel llega hoy en día de desalinización. Son 80% del agua que llega a las casas y a la industria de ese recurso. Además, claro que se trabaja conscientemente en mejorar los métodos y abaratar el coste. El tercero y último que voy a mencionar, hay mucho, muchos más, pero no, no tenemos suficiente tiempo, es que los non-revenue water, agua sin ingresos, lo que se pierde, en Israel forma solamente 3%, eh, el número más, más eh, bajo eh, en el mundo. Eh, la crisis actual solamente ha enfatizado los desafíos de ese, este sector de agua que no son nuevos. Una consecuencia de, de lo que vivimos diariamente es que en el mundo 
van a ser más digital. Con tantos trabajos perdidos, lo más rápido que eso su sucede, eh, lo más rápido que la calidad de la vida va a subir o siga a subir. Volviendo a la cooperación que tenemos con el BID, vamos a tomarnos un reto de poner en esa mapa de eh, países que tratan lo más sus aguas con la mejor tecnología, que, que desalinan en donde sea adecuado y que bajen sus aguas pérdidas, los países de América Latina y el Caribe. Nosotros en Israel estamos aquí para dar nuestra humilde experiencia y seguro que con, con un gigante como el BID, que además no se asuste y eso llega de los, los más altos niveles de apoyar proyectos, aunque tengan un riesgo, y cuando se innova siempre hay un riesgo, seguro que lo logramos. Así que nosotros en la Embajada de Israel aquí en Washington y todos mis colegas eh, representantes del Ministerio de Economía eh, en las embajadas en sus países, estamos a su disposición. Que disfrutemos de eh, todos de este webinar. Gracias. Uh, gracias. Thank you, Ifat, for this interesting presentation and for your ongoing partnership uh, with the Water the Division here in the IDB. Um, I would like now to present Mr. Avi Lubton, Acting Vice President of the International Collaboration Division in the Water uh, Innovation uh, in the Innovation Authority, uh, to present Israel's innovation ecosystem and the role of the Innovation Authority. Um, Avi, the floor is yours. Avi? Yeah. Okay. Now, it's okay. now it's okay. So I will repeat again. So first, uh, good morning to all of you in uh, the Americas and good afternoon to all the participants here in Israel. I'm very glad to participate in this webinar and uh, for the uh, good collaboration with IDB. I think we can both be proud of what we achieved till now. And uh, I think the, the, the future, even the near future is um, very promising and I would I, I feel that we can fulfill it uh, uh, much even better than what we have done till now and uh, I'll take this opportunity and try to uh, explain a bit about uh, the innovation authority and uh, how we can proceed and um, so next so uh, there, there is a lot of slide that can describe what the Innovation Authority is doing, but I'll try to focus on the main, uh, the main topic. So first, we are basically invest, investing in innovation to promote sustainable and inclusive growth. So, you know, it, it took, um, I would say, uh, several dozens uh, of years uh, to achieve what Israel, uh, the, the state of Israel uh, today in, in terms of innovation. So the first, uh, the first goal will be to how to strengthening the existing innovation ecosystem. So this is uh, not, it's even tougher than to achieve this position. Secondly, uh, we are trying to enhance economic impact in what we are doing. We are not basically trying to support innovation in, in basic research and, and, and stuff like this, but trying to um, to create uh, impact from those technologies that we uh, support and, and encourage. And thirdly, um, to, to create uh, and generate a breakthrough technologies, we need to enable disruptive technologies. This is why we are focusing on mar market failures and, and risk is something that is very um, regular in our corridor. So we are looking for the next breakthrough and trying to encourage it. And we know that this is with high risk, high risk, but if the government or the innovation authority will not do so, so probably the, the private sector will not, will not do the same, they will not do, do it uh, as well. So we are trying to focus on those market failures and try to support those risky and disruptive technologies. Next. Now, as a, uh, centralized and um, uh, we are in terms of innovation I think to be small is, a, is an advantage so as a centralized um, and, and basically the uh, unique um, organization in Israel dealing with the innovation we are trying 
to support all the technologies in all sectors and all the value chain of companies and products. So it can be from a single entrepreneur to a startup, small, medium, large, and it can be in, in any of uh, those technologies um, uh, that develop. It can be in agriculture, in digital health, in cyber, in food tech, in big data, pharma, and so on. So we are open and trying to uh, adjust our tools, as you can uh, in a minute see, that it will uh, provide support to, do to those um, innovative projects and try to promote them to really take the risk and, and try to develop the next technology. Next. A bit, uh, some of the figures of the last year, the recent year in uh, 2019, um, you, can, you can have here a, a feel about the sizing of the Innovation Authority. I, by the way, I think 2020 will be even uh, will be a record year. Uh, we're expecting much more than 3,000 applications that we receive on each one of those uh, uh, programs that we are operating. Uh, we we held uh, almost 120 committees. In these committees, we are deciding which project will be supported and which not. Um, we supported more than. 1,100 companies uh, last year, and uh, with 1,600 uh, uh, project, it means that some, some companies even received uh, uh, more than um, one project support. So you can you can apply to the authority even for a, a more than one initiative. The annual budget typically is about half billion. What you're seeing here is 1.7 million uh, uh, billion shekels. But in, uh, if we translate it to a uh, US dollar, so it's about half billion. And you can see uh, which are the verticals that are most uh, supported. So life, life science is, is almost a third and, and also AI companies. By the way, in, in AI, Israel is really uh, leading um, in this field. So there is a lot of uh, activities, by the way, in all sectors, but the life science, um, the AI are really leading this, um, this um, um, uh, innovate, innovative uh, uh, technologies. And uh, also what we can see here that uh, every year there are new companies that join to this ecosystem, new startups, and they are applying to the authority as well. So we can see that last year, 440 new companies that never applied to the, to, to the authority joined to this ecosystem. Next. Uh, one, of the, one of the main divisions in, in the authority is the International Collaboration Division. Uh, indeed, we have other five professional divisions that are uh, dealing uh, with the, the academia, startups, grow company, advanced manufacturing, human resources, but also international collaboration. And I think it's, it's very obvious that Israel, a small country that uh, basically is an uh, island, uh, will, will, uh, will uh, um, try to connect to any country and any organization to promote the economy and innovation. This is why we are uh, having uh, so wide uh, uh, relationships uh, across the globe, of course, with the US and Canada and uh, South America even in Africa, Asia Pacific, Europe, of course. So Australia, so we are trying to bridge, uh, to, to bridge Israel with those frameworks that we are having with any, any, almost any country in the globe. So this is basically the, the, the main goal of the international division is to connect and to take the technology and excellence pool that we have in Israel, by the way, not only in water, but in any other technology and try to connect them to the, to the uh, uh, world markets and innovative uh, technologies that we can collaborate uh, with them there. So basically you can find an open door in the IIA for any collaboration from any country. To do that, and uh, it will take me a lot to, uh, to describe each one of those, uh, what we call the international tools, uh, tools. In each one of these uh, circles, there is, uh, there is basically a framework that enable 
companies from Israel and companies or entities uh, from abroad to collaborate. Um, the main message is that uh, if you find the right match, so probably we have the right tool to support it. So it can be with emerging markets in, 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 in several fields. It can be in water and energy and health and so on. It, it could be a pilot's uh, a project to, to, to demonstrate and validate the, the new technologies and innovative technologies in better sites. I think this, uh, what we have done in the last call, in the first call, and, and uh, this that we just uh, uh, finalized, we can see something like there. But we also do a, a bilateral R&D, mainly between two companies that are developing the new products, uh, the, the new product together. And also we have foundations that uh, support um, uh, uh, collaboration uh, to, to create and to develop technologies and also engaging with academia. And there is a uh, other two strategic tools that uh, deal with um, uh, incubators and innovation labs. So each one of them related to a, a, a foreign, part, a foreign par partner that can um, uh, use uh, one or more from this uh, framework. And, and again, the, the, main, the main message is we will find the match. We will have the tool to support it. Perfect. Avi, one minute left. Can I, can I continue? Yeah, just one minute left. Thank you. Ah, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll make it fast. Uh, just, just to give you a, an idea about the size of the Israeli water tech ecosystem, I think Israel is one of the leading countries in the world. And you can see uh, the total number of, of startups in Israel is about something between 6,000 to 7,000, about 3%, uh, uh, approximately about 200 companies dealing with water and you can see that the spread of the sub-segment in each, one, in, in, in each uh, um, um, field is, is quite dealing with uh, dozens of, of companies and you can see here um, a, a wide spectrum of irrigation, uh, wastewater treatment, uh, desalination, domestic use, engineering and so on. So I think we can cover the whole, the whole ecosystem of water with the, with the technology that we have in these companies in Israel. Next. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, this is some examples of those uh, collaboration that we have made, uh, but, but I will skip this because there is no time and go to the, 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 the last slide almost that, that described the, the core proposal that we, we launched together uh, just a few months ago. And I think this is a, a, great, a great framework that uh, 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 we, of course, would like to, to continue with this uh, framework. And uh, uh, with all the humility, I think that uh, this is a great uh, results that we have two Israeli companies uh, will do project in uh, or pilots in, in three, uh, uh, three locations in Lima, in Mexico, in Brazil. And I, I, we really look forward uh, uh, to work with IDB and, and try to expand this in the, in the next round and even thinking again wider and bigger to other uh, fields as well. And Next, and thank you very much. And uh, uh, you are welcome to uh, contact us. We have a dedicated uh, uh, desk for emerging markets. So uh, there is always someone that will uh, listen to you and try to help and try to uh, uh, promote this collaboration that I mentioned. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Avi, for this great presentation and looking forward to continue our partnership uh, this coming fall. Um, Going to our next part, um, I would like now to introduce Mr. Yoav Barlev, Strategic Partnership Manager at Startup Nation Central. Yoav, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hila. Hello to everyone uh, from IDB, the presenters, and all the other attendees who are here uh, listening in. My name is Yoav Barlev, Strategic Partnerships Manager at Startup, Startup Nation Central. I'm happy to be here and present to you these truly innovative companies. But before I do so, a few words about Startup Nation Central and our collaboration with IDB, which will help put some context as to why these uh, companies were selected. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Startup Nation Central is an independent nonprofit that connects business, government, NGO leaders from around the world with Israeli innovation uh, for the ultimate goal of creating partnerships and long-term uh, collaboration. 
Now we do this in a number of ways. And the first and foremost is our Finder platform, which is an easy to use, up-to-date, free online platform for discovering and connecting with the thousands of startups, corporates, investors, innovation hubs, and other stakeholders active in Israel's tech ecosystem. Each one has their own unique profile, which our in-house analysts are very busy updating daily. Uh, it's also completely free, uh, so be sure to check it out. I've added a link uh, in the chat section uh, for you to find it easily. Um, now through the Finder platform, we're also able to generate comprehensive data-driven reports on industry trends, performance metrics, and interesting developments, uh, which will further help global entities learn about the ecosystem and aid them through their journey of collaborating in Israel. Uh, this has worked well, and over the years, we have seen interest from some of our global partners to adopt a similar like platform, uh, like Finder, to embed in their local ecosystem. Uh, so more recently, we came up with the Global Finder platform. The idea behind the Global Finder platform is to empower emerging innovation hubs worldwide, worldwide to build and manage their own regional ecosystem databases, uh, thereby increasing their internal connectivity and global visibility. Not only does this accelerate the regional innovation ecosystem, but also creating opportunities for cross ecosystem pollination uh, and multilateral collaboration between Israel and those ecosystems. Uh, today, you can find the Global Finder platform in New Zealand, Thailand, Michigan, Texas, and most recently, Taiwan. Uh, we're working closely with IDD Lab to see how this platform can also be available in the Latin America and the Caribbean. Another method we promote innovation collaboration is through our tailor-made delegations. Uh, in 2019, we had over 60 such delegations hosting business leaders from around the world, including President Moreno of IDB. As you can imagine, uh, this year has been a little more challenging to host these types of delegations in Israel, uh, so we have shifted the model to digital format. Um, now, let's talk about the, the companies that are here today. So how did we get to the companies? A few months ago, we started uh, collaborating with IDB's Knowledge Innovation and Communication Division, which we have identified five sectors, infrastructure and water and sanitation being one of them, in which we felt Israel innovation could have a positive impact. The process began by getting a deep understanding of the challenges in the region for each of the sectors, which we then matched with Israeli companies that could offer solutions. Part of the criteria was also identifying technology companies that can implement or have already implemented their technology in the LAC region. Um, now, so Startup Nation Central came up with a list of 20 to 40 recommended companies for each of the sectors. Our counterparts at IDB are then prioritizing the list and preparing follow-up questions for due diligence. We will then schedule meetings between IDB representatives and the selected companies, which will hopefully lead to executing pilots in the LAC region and eventually implementation. Today, we'll be showcasing a few of these companies. Each one will have 10 minutes to present. If you have any questions, please be sure to write them in the chat and we will do our best to answer them at the end of the presentations. Now, if there are too many questions or we just run out of time, we'll also do our best to answer them offline. Okay, so uh, let's begin with our first company. I'm happy to introduce, introduce you to Ido Blanc, VP of Business Development at Kandu. Hi, Ido. Hi everybody. Um, happy, happy to talk. Um, so um, I'm a VP Business Development uh, at Kandu, um, and we are we are doing smart wastewater monitoring um, in the last uh, in the last nine years. Um, we are active in. Uh, 13 uh, countries. Um, in Europe, we are active in Italy, uh, France, uh, Netherlands, Spain, Greece. Uh, we have projects in uh, Australia. Um, we have, uh, uh, and we have um, a project in some, several states in the US. Um, we are doing uh, smart wastewater monitoring um, that is um, uh, mostly uh, referring to uh, 
pollution events that coming from industries. Uh, we have the ability to uh, to detect um, abno abnormal events. We call it pollution events um, in the network. We have the ability to pinpoint the source of the of the polluter. Uh, we have the ability to uh, 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 give early warning to the treatment plant that something is coming. Uh, that uh, there was an event from from this let's say a high COD event and it will arrive to the treatment plant uh, within uh, one hour and a half um, and we also have a, a automatic sample sampler that is uh, triggered by event and once the algorithm detects a, a severe pollution events it's triggering the automatic sampler to grab a sample which will be um, a an evidence for the for the utility uh, to go and act uh, uh, in to go and and talk to the to the industries that are polluting in order to uh, de decrease the amount of pollution events in the network. Um, this is our core business. This is what we are doing for the last nine years, um, and in the last three months months. Um, we started to develop, uh, we took all, all the capabilities that we developed in the last nine years, and, and we did a kind of pivot for the solution. Uh, so now we are going in parallel with another solution uh, that called uh, 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 wastewater-based epidemiologic surveillance. And we are detecting uh, COVID-19 uh, via the wastewater. So we collaborated with the professors from uh, from the Technion, uh, professors from uh, uh, Ben Gurion University, and uh, we have also Dr. Itai Bao, which is the head of uh, Israel National Center of Environmental uh, Virology uh, from Shiba Tel Hashomer, and it's uh, it's uh, part of the Ministry of Health. Um, so the need. Uh, for our solution is to allow the population to safely return to normal. The goal is to provide alert of alert of epidemic outbreak and, and its locations. And the solution is online mapping of infected uh, population using wastewater monitoring. So now I will go through the uh, the solution uh, phases. So um, when we are coming uh, when we are coming to um, uh, to a city. Uh, we we are doing a analysis of the wastewater network, and we are dividing the city into collection basins uh, of one hundred thousand people, each one of them. So let's say that we we are in a city of three million people. We will divide the city into thirty different uh, uh, areas, uh, that each one of them representing one one hundred thousand people. Then we will install at, at the, out, at the uh, outlet of each area, we will install our uh, units, which con consisting of a data logger, um, uh, sensors, flow meter, and the automatic sampler. Okay, all the equipment is installed inside the manhole, so you don't need to do any infrastructure change. Um, and everything is powered by battery and transmitting the information to the server via the cellular network. Um, so over there, we are measuring quality parameters, flow, and we have the ability to sample in the right uh, sampling protocol. Um, so we develop the algorithms uh, that are able to differentiate between uh, residential uh, wastewater and industrial wastewater. It's important for the COVID detection because the uh, the uh, industrial wastewater act like an inhibitors and it's destroying the RNA remains of the virus in the wastewater. So it's very important uh, to to uh, grab the sample in the right moment when the conditions are met. Okay, so. Uh, the automatic sampler will grab a sample uh, from each area. Um, 
then we will take the sample to the lab to do a, to do a analysis and to uh, look for uh, the amount of RNA remains of the of the virus. Then the results will go back into the system, and the system and the mathematical model that uh, developed by our uh, 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 researcher team uh, will calculate in each area. Um, what is the range of sick people, uh, uh, the, the sick uh, COVID people, okay? Um, we can see that it's like a traffic light. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, green is, uh, is uh, below threshold. Yellow, there is an, um, uh, it's an area with the infection. And red is a severe infection. Then, in the in the critical areas where we have uh, many sick people, uh, we are doing another phase, which we are calling zoom in uh, phase. Um, we will come uh, and we will uh, break the specific area of 100,000 people into sub areas. We will come with uh, 10 to 20 units in order to uh, identify where is the um, where, where in which streets or in, in which neighborhoods or in which streets um, uh, we, we, have, um, we have an out outbreak. Um, and uh, from our experience in Israel, uh, we did a pilot, a proof of concept in a city of Ashkelon, which is a city of 150,000 people. Um, and, and we were able to see um, uh, um, that there, that there was an outbreak in specific neighborhoods in the city um, while um, uh, it was not known uh, in uh, any other place. Ministry of Health did not know it and, and we were able to actually predict or, or to alert one week before uh, about the outbreak. Um, of course, we can track uh, trends um, and, and that's it. We actually providing an end-to-end -end solution, okay? Um, we have, we, we, have uh, uh, we, are, we are doing knowledge transfer um, uh, for the, for the uh, um, wastewater network uh, uh, capabilities and also for the uh, lab protocols. In countries that there is no uh, sufficient lab capabilities, we are also um, uh, defining now a mobile lab that we will be able to send uh, to specific uh, countries. And over there, we will perform all the, the tests. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Thank you, Mila. Yeah, I think you can move to our next speaker. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ido. Um, our next uh, our next presentation is IO, IO Site, uh, which does data management and analytic solutions for the water and energy sector. Presenting this company is Guy Meiri, head of business development. Hello, Guy. Hello. Good, yeah. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me well and see me? All right, thank you. And the big screen, right? The right screen. Um, there's no presentation mode yet. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Second. Fantastic. Please see it. All right. Now? Yeah. All right. Thank you. So uh, good morning and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, before you today. Um, so my name is Guy, as uh, said, uh, head of business development for IOSite. So in my presentation, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our company, uh, about our solutions and some case studies which are related to COVID-19 to actually working with our solutions during COVID-19, during the pandemic days. So. Some of the slides are actually gonna be in Spanish. So hopefully it will be easier for some of you to, to track what I'm saying uh, and also afterwards to read it uh, when you receive the presentation. But not all the slides are in Spanish. So who is IOSite? 
Um, IOSite is a, uh, a leading uh, provider of data management and analytics solutions, specifically for the water sector. Uh, we also serve the energy sector, uh, but mostly water, uh, about 75% water clients. Uh, we have over 100 installations worldwide and we've been operating since 2007. So we're not really a startup, we're a small company, but with a lot of experience and a lot of lessons learned, which are embedded into our solutions. Uh, and our team is uh, basically comprised of both um, um, water experts, uh, environmental engineers, um, as well as software developers and data scientists. If you look at our client uh, segments, uh, they include um, uh, water and wastewater under which I, I include facilities, treatment facilities, uh, wastewater treatment, water treatment, but also distribution networks. We work around the world. Obviously we started in Israel. I have a lot of clients in Israel, but also in the US, in China and other countries. We have a lot of desalination uh, clients, basically all the desalination plants in Israel, including, and also the water authority work with the, uh, some desalination facilities in the US and Cyprus as well. And we also uh, do uh, environmental uh, related work, uh, watershed quality monitoring, real-time water quality monitoring and others. And as I mentioned, also some energy clients. So as I mentioned, we provide an engineering uh, driven uh, solution. It is vertically integrated. I'm gonna talk about it in a minute. It is based on, on years of experience, dozens of projects, over 100 projects, uh, a team which is um, combined of uh, various prof professionals. And we have a lot of water specific assets already developed, embedded into our solution, into our data management and analytics uh, solution, uh, basically generated through all those projects. So these are formulas, dashboards, reports, templates, all these things. We have a partner in uh, Latin America, it's BLAS, and Paul from BLAS is actually on, on this session with us. He might be available uh, to answer some questions at the end of the Q&A. So uh, we're happy to be working with uh, Paul and BLAS. And now I'm gonna jump into our solutions. We, we provide vertically integrated smart water suite, as we call it. So it starts with really, our core platform is called iGreen, it's the bottom two layers of this, uh, di of this um, illustration. It is responsible for both extracting, normalizing, modeling the data, making sure there is a robust data foundation, a good set of data to be working on. And then once you have that, then uh, you can start actually delivering value outcomes, either dashboards, reports, very basic outcomes, but also uh, analytics, advanced analytics. And we've actually have an embedded algorithm builder in, uh, with which we developed several specific uh, domain algorithms for various uh, purposes, like water uh, treatment um, plant optimization, like um, water quality monitoring in rivers and watersheds and others. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, just saying that this really um, provides an illustration of, of how we believe our system really includes all the required components for a robust, water specific data management and analytics platform. Everything from the down, kind of like the basic level of the normalization, collection, collecting the data, synchronizing the various types of data, all the way to storing it, presenting it, analyzing it, and then scaling it up with additional uh, facilities, equipment, whatever you wanna do with it. So as I mentioned, a comprehensive solution. We work with, uh, we extract data from a variety of data sources, some real-time sensors, some uh, lab data, SCADA systems, GIS, all the basically data sources you can think about in the water world. We've developed connectors and, and, uh, and uh, protocols for collecting the data, storing it, treating it, and providing the outcomes, which are the bottom uh, uh, layers here in this uh, diagram. And the value uh, we deliver is for operational optimization, for financial uh, performance, and for regulatory compliance. This is some illustrations of our dashboards. So you can see some both mobile as well as web-based dashboards, as well as reporting, an event management platform, which is, uh, you can get really events, you define, you define rules or algorithms, and then you define signals, you get uh, um, alerts, either on your mobile phone via text or on your uh, computer screen, text. 
you have a map view uh, in case you need it. And we have developed some, uh, as I mentioned, advanced analytics uh, solutions uh, for water quality monitoring, for uh, uh, optimization of water treatment, wastewater treatment plants, and uh, a few others that I'm gonna talk about a little bit in the next uh, couple of minutes. So moving to, um, to COVID-19, so how is this all related to COVID-19, to the post pandemic? I'm gonna actually illustrate it through uh, some case studies. So the, um, before we move into the specific case studies, we've worked with clients over the last few months and really learned that the, there are like four themes that uh, you can call, call them value themes uh, during this period. First of all is continuity, the ability for a facility to really continue uh, its operations in an as, as possibly uninterrupted way. Then convenience, the ability for people, for managers, for operations managers, for others, for engineers to uh, work conveniently remotely. Then comprehensiveness, also the ability to actually manage the entire operations and the ability to collaborate either internally uh, within the uh, water utility or water treatment plant or any type of facility and with us. And I'm gonna talk about an interesting case study about that. So the first uh, case I wanna talk about is the Shafdan wastewater treatment plant. So the Shafdan is the largest water treatment plant in Israel, one of the largest in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, we're working there with a the team. Um, it has been mentioned before that uh, Israel basically uh, recycles most of its wastewater uh, and goes for, uh, for irrigation purposes mostly. Uh, so it's one of our clients, they use our system. And uh, basically during COVID-19, a lot of people could not be on site. Some of people have to work from home. So they use our dashboards and uh, mobile dashboards uh, recently uh, also, and the reporting engine for really manage this entire facility uh, remotely. Most recently, they installed a cybersecurity component, which is a data diode from Waterfall, uh, from a company, another Israeli company called Waterfall, which really allowed them also to access everything through their mobile phone. So this is one example how the largest wastewater treatment plant is using our uh, solutions uh, during the uh, COVID-19 uh, period. Another example is the Palmachim desalination plant. Uh, as I mentioned, we work with the, all the desalination sector in Israel, all, uh, all the facilities in Israel. So this is actually a picture from the operation manager's house, home. Uh, so really with, with uh, our uh, dashboard on his uh, laptop screen. So again, they've been using our system uh, remotely, really actually they decided to um, increase the number of reports that they uh, generate because kind of like to allow them to monitor the facility more uh, easily uh, and more comprehensively. Um, again, I mentioned also maintaining business continuity. Uh, one minute, Guy. Okay. All right, thank you. So another example, I'm getting close to the end. Another example is, it's quite a different, it's kind of like a slightly different one. It's also a desalination plant. It's in the US, Carlsbad. Desalination plant in California. Uh, they also use our system. Maybe you heard that they had to stay for like a shelter in place shift of three weeks. Like they really decided to kind of like make a sacrifice, the, uh, all the uh, people on the ground. But also some of the people who used our system remotely and were still able to generate the report. They have a lot of reporting requirements. So the operation manager uh, used our system remotely to really continue uh, with supporting the people that are on the ground. So again, it's a matter of like collaborating. Uh, some people are on the grounds, it's a hybrid model. Some people are not on the grounds, uh, remotely at, at home. So that's another example that uh, we have. And I'm gonna skip the, this one and move to the last actually uh, examples that I wanna talk about. The bottom one actually is, is a project we've completed very recently. Uh, it's delivering actually a project completely remotely to uh, water utility in California. So the system is, we've done, we actually completed the project uh, without even being there once. It's live and running. Uh, if we have time in the Q&A session, I can actually show you a screen of that. I call it the COVID-19 newborn. It really illustrates how we can collaborate with a utility uh, remotely during COVID-19 to actually deliver a project end to end. That's it. Okay, perfect, thank, thank you. Great. Thank you, thank you, Guy, for that. Um, I would like to now introduce to you a very interesting company that uh, maybe six months ago 
you wouldn't you wouldn't have thought that there would be a need uh, for such technology. But today's new normal, it can maybe even be a must uh, for many businesses if they want to reopen. So please welcome uh, Neta Stahl and Max Simonovsky. Hi everyone, uh, can you hear me well? All right, yeah, yes, so hi, I'm uh, really happy to be here with you. Um, and we started this whole uh, meeting today talking about water challenges. Water is used for drinking, for uh, growing food and for hygiene, which is really what we're going to be addressing. Um, and as you have kindly said, uh, hygiene has really become a very, very uh, talked about issue in the past few weeks around the COVID-19 crisis. Um, what happens, what we're gonna do now is I'm going to show you what happens when hand hygiene issues are not addressed and I'm going to show you in different areas, different verticals that we work with. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about our solution, how we help these verticals overcome the challenge. Um, and lastly, I'm gonna give you a short dive into our dashboard to see what sort of data we provide in order to help uh, our clients with infection control in their organizations. So let's dive right in. The first, hmm, the first vertical that we work with um, is the uh, food and beverage services, basically restaurants. Uh, restaurants, when they do not address hand hygiene issues properly, they uh, expose themselves to major, major uh, losses. We've seen this with Chipotle losing about $11 billion of market cap a few years ago. Uh, we've seen this with several restaurants around the world. Sometimes restaurant chain chains even have to close down because of a food outbreak uh, that happens. So in restaurants, it's really critical that employees maintain a high level of hand hygiene when they are serving food to us. Otherwise, people can get sick, people can even die and we're talking about lawsuits and we're talking about shutting down the chains and it's really um, very bad, both health-wise and economically. In food production sector, the, the major loss that we can see around um, products coming out which are not clean enough is um, seven, is, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, <laughs> so in the food production industry, what we see when employees are not careful enough with hand hygiene is that products come out and they are faulty. How bad is this problem? We're talking about $7 billion that are lost only in the US every year just because of food recalls. So we're talking about, again, very large scale implications. And in the healthcare sector, the healthcare sector is a little different because here we see behavior that is different. By definition, within a healthcare um, facility, doctors work with sick people. They touch one patient, then they move on to the next patient, and they really don't want to transmit things between uh, these uh, patients. And so they have to maintain a really high level of hand hygiene. And that's not a very easy thing to do uh, because there are a few things that go into hand hygiene and we'll go into that in a second. The last sector that we're dealing with is kids. Kids are really unaware of hand hygiene they might touch something nasty, they might put their hands in their mouth, and they will very easily spread diseases within a school facility. Um, we've seen school districts in the US having to shut down because of norovirus outbreaks. And so really helping kids have an infrastructure, a healthy infrastructure that will enable them to remain healthy and to be more aware of hand hygiene is critical in order to avoid mass outbreaks of nasty illnesses. Before we go into the solution, I just want to say one word about a few words about hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is a seemingly simple topic. I mean, we go to the tap, we take some soap, scrub, scrub, and that's it. But the truth is that it's not that simple. First of all, you can't see who washed their hands. So it's difficult to track which one of your employees were careful enough. And the second thing, you can't see how well they've done so. So an employee might think that they've done a good job and they've gone and washed their hands often enough, but maybe they didn't wash well enough. And then even though they think they're doing everything by the protocol, they're still spreading disease within their um, environment. So let's talk about solutions. 
Um, we've developed the Echo Hand Hygiene Micro Station. Basically, it's a station, as you can see in this uh, photo, and I'll send a video after this uh, presentation. You put in your hands, it's a no-touch system, so no infection from touching anything around the sink. The, the uh, micro station dispenses soap and water, and then it tells you for how long you need to um, rub your hands. On the, you can see here on the screen, this is like a meter, it tells, tells you how much you have to go on with the scrubbing, and then it will give you the exact amount of water. And when I say the exact amount of water, we're gonna talk about um, water conservation in a second, but it really gives water that is at the correct temperature and the correct amount so that you're not wasting unnecessary water in order to perform a correct hand washing cycle. Um, so what do we offer? Our units offer facial recognition, hand movement um, and gesturing recognition, and and then all of the things that I said before that you don't have to touch the system and it indicates to the user for how long they're using. That means that we're able to track how well each user uh, is washing their hands and to show all of this data on a dashboard, which I will show you, to you in a second. All of this is sent through an IoT device, basically sent over the internet so that the dashboard is accessible from um, wherever the hand hygiene manager is. <laughs> so, like I said before, we're going to talk about um, conservation, water conservation. Using our device saves up to 95% of water otherwise used um, in, a, in a regular wash. I mean, the average hand washing cycle takes between two and two and a half liters, and we use roughly 200 milliliters of water for a long cycle. We use up to 60% less reagent because we dispense the exact amount. And then we use less electricity, and this refers to places that would otherwise heat up their water. World Health Organization and the CDC recommend to use water that is at a 40 degree um, temperature. And so since we only warm up the exact amount of water, we save on electricity as well. And in terms of the quality assurance, what you get in our dashboard is the employee ID, time and location of where they wash their hands and how often, whether they did or did not use reagents, and what the lathering quality was. And I want to show you all this on the dashboard. All right, here we are. Can you see the screen? Cool. So yes. here we see a uh, high quality wash at 1215, user number 292, caught the reagent. This, this uh, little uh, check mark indicates whether they've collected the reagent and they scrubbed for 18 out of the 20 seconds and they washed, they rinsed their hands for 20 out of the 20 seconds that the uh, water was sprinkled down. And that means that they got a 95% um, score on their washing. However, this user over here wasn't even looking at the camera didn't collect the reagent, kind of pretended to scrub their hands and got a very bad score. And that means that you're able to see, okay, here is somebody, um, in this case, it's not identifiable, but maybe you can sometimes see a user that used the machine but didn't um, scrub their hands for long enough or didn't collect the reagent or didn't rinse for the entire duration. And you can kind of go and have an educated uh, conversation with that employee and say, maybe it would be better if you wash your hands better in order to avoid um, outbreaks and nasty things. Uh, so, Nita, two, two minutes. Okay. So to go back to our presentation, here is a demonstration um, of a food facility, a food service facility. It's a sushi uh, restaurant. We installed one of our sinks and this kind of shows you um, what happens when you have a better infrastructure to support the hygiene habits of your employees. The wash quality of the employees in this facility went up throughout the two months that they were using the micro station. The percent of bad cycles, basically the cycles which the employee would say to themselves, but I washed my hands and it was a good cycle, but that wasn't really a good cycle. The percent of bad cycles went down and the total amount of wash cycles went up by 30%. So that's a pretty good statistic of um, why a restaurant 
or any place really looking to maintain a high hygiene, high hand hygiene should install this as superior infrastructure to what they have today. Um, I think that I'm about done, if this is okay. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Looks great. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we're on to our last uh, company, uh, Watergen, a truly innovative company that has been around for, for, for over a decade um, and have implemented their technology across the globe. Uh, so please welcome Zach Fenster, VP of Business Development. Hi, Zach. Hi, everyone. Bienvenidos. Shalom. Um, it's great to be here with you all today, virtually, if not in person. I'd like to thank Ms. Rodriguez Ortez and IDB, and of course, also the Israel Innovation Authority uh, and Startup Nation Central for pull, pulling together this really uh, amazing and very interesting event. It's always great to be together with other uh, Israeli innovative water companies. I am just going to um, share my screen with you. Great. So can you all see that? Yes, we can see it. Great. Wonderful. So, you know, the conversation today is, of course, about water. Um, and it's been uh, really fascinating to hear about all of the other companies um, here that have presented already. And a theme that continues to sort of um, return on itself and, and, and is oftentimes spoken about in water is how do we conserve, how do we save, how do we monitor? Um, but I think even before the COVID-19 crisis and certainly now that we're in the COVID-19 crisis, we also need to have a complete paradigm shift when we're talking about water broadly and drinking water specifically. And that's not only how do we conserve what we have, but how do we make more? and actually guarantee that all people in the world, no matter who they are, what their station in life is, where they're coming from, has the drinking water that they need in order to thrive and survive. And what we're doing at Watergen is utilizing a completely unique and internationally patented technology in order to create more drinking water than exists today, drinking water from the air. Now, the drinking water crisis, excuse me, I'm sorry. The drinking water crisis today, uh, I think is actually, and you know, it's, it's uh, connected to the current uh, COVID-19 crisis. It's actually, I think, probably the biggest crisis that we face today. And that is first and foremost, because it kills, um, millions of people per year and has tremendously deleterious effects on people's health in indirect ways as well. Many, many more than millions of people. We've been hearing about that already over from some of the uh, speakers today, the connection between drinking water and health more broadly and COVID-19 specifically. Now, what we need in order to have a healthy water and drinking water system is we need both a clean source, right? And we need a transportation system in order to deliver that source from where it exists to where it's needed. Now, I don't wanna to get too into it because I think that the audience uh, and certainly IDB is, is very familiar with this, but in terms of source, to make a long story short, today we're running out of clean drinking uh, resources in the world. And this is because of global warming, this is because of increased demand, um, this is because of pollution, et cetera, et cetera. And as global population is expected to rise, demand is rising just as our water supply is actually evaporating. Now, 
there are a bunch of different technologies that people use in order um, to address this issue, this issue of source. For example, desalination is a very important thing here in Israel. The problem is that with desalination, of course, you need that source of an ocean. So if you're not uh, living next to an ocean, then that's a huge problem. Um, but you also need the infrastructure, as I mentioned before, to get the source or the water that is from the desalination plant to the people who need it. We in Israel are a very small country, but around the world and certainly in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, this is oftentimes not the case. And in much of the Western world and indeed actually around the world, much of our water infrastructure is rusted and filled with dangerous pollutants if it exists at all, right? If we're talking about places in Africa and Southeast Asia, and, and really around the world, oftentimes rural communities, there is no infrastructure at all. So people have to get water somewhere else, right? They get water filtration systems, but these oftentimes don't work. They get dr plastic drinking water bottles, but these are costly and they create tremendous amounts of pollution. So what we see is if we go back to this water equation, we need a new source and we need a new transportation system in order to address this tremendous global problem. And what we at WaterGen are, do, uh, are doing is basically completely refiguring and revolutionizing that drinking water source. We're create that drinking water equation, excuse me. We are creating a new source of clean drinking water and that is the air all around us, right? And because we are creating clean drinking water from the air that's around us, be it in our home, be it in our office, school, hospital, municipality, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. Because we're producing drinking water right where it's needed, we don't need that transportation system. And so we're actually enabling plug and drink solutions. I'll present uh, a bunch of our different de devices in a moment but we have plug and drink solutions that completely eliminate the need for infrastructure, for pipes, for plastic bottles, et cetera. Now, how do we do this? I'm not gonna get too much into the tech, uh, technological details because of course uh, we can speak about them in the Q and A, but Watergen created the world's first ever drinking water extractor. And what it is, is sort of like if you can think of a heat exchanger, which we find uh, in a lot of appliances, but, uh, you know, in your air conditioner, for example, you, you wouldn't want to drink this water and it doesn't create enough water and you'd have to pour a tremendous amount of energy into the heat exchanger in your air conditioner to, to produce enough uh, water. What we did is create what we call the genius. Um, this is our unique and like I said, internationally patented heat exchanger. And it enables us to first create the best quality drinking water. It's made, as you can see here on the slide, of food grade polymers. And there's, this is the only uh, heat exchanger in the world that's created from food grade polymers. It's constructed in a way to maximize energy efficiency. So we're creating more liters per uh, kilowatt hour than anyone else on the market. In fact, we're on average five times more efficient than anyone else. And this is very important because power, electricity costs money. And so our leader is very affordable. And finally, um, and, and very importantly, with the Genius, we can produce significant amounts of water, even in dry climate. So as you can see here, as low as 20% relative humidity, we can still produce significant amounts of water. And this is critical when we're scaling this technology all over the world. Uh, two minutes, Zach. Great. So I'm going to uh, very quickly just tell you that we're oftentimes, without getting into the details, we're oftentimes asked, you know, so how does air quality um, impact your clean drinking water? And the uh, answer is that it doesn't impact it at all. We've had um, thorough testing in some of the most polluted environments in the world, in New Delhi, um, in Beijing, etc. And because we clean the air before we turn it into water, and then, as you can see here, pass it into pass that air into our unique heat exchanger, the Genius, and then uh, put the water 
as it's once it's already become water into our state of the art uh, clean drinking water um, quality maintenance and treatment system. The water, no matter what the air quality, is uh, of the highest uh, drinking water quality. Now here you can see just a range of our products. Um, and I'll just, uh, you can see this uh, when I share the presentation afterwards. Um, but what's important to see here is that we have both large scale solutions, right? 5,000 liters per day for villages, um, you know, large buildings, hospitals, et cetera, down to small solutions uh, like the Jenny, which provides 27 liters per day. It's perfect for a home or an office. And this is critical for COVID um, because, I'll skip these, because as you can see here, um, you know, in the time of COVID-19, what's critical is that we have what we need in order to thrive and survive right where we are, right? Um, so what that Jenny and what indeed all of our different devices afford you to do, um, be uh, the partner or the customer, a large international organization like IDB, uh, a governmental partner or uh, a commercial partner, is it provides you complete clean drinking water independence. Again, because we're providing that source and we are eliminating the need for that infrastructure. So here you see a picture from South Africa, um, which is uh, happening right now. Um, and just to bring it home to the area of Latin America and Caribbean itself, here we launched, you can see the president of Guatemala uh, launching Water Gen's national project in Guatemala. You can see in the background, our Gen M machine, which produces up to 800 liters per day. This is part of a national project that we launched with him and which will be scaling our technology around Guatemala in the next weeks and months in order to completely solve the drinking water crisis uh, in Guatemala, both in emergency times and non-emergency times. Just a quick note, this is actually in the national emergency warehouse uh, before the machine was deployed in order to help Guatemala fight um, lack of clean drinking water in areas that were impacted most recently by Hurricane Amanda. And finally, I don't have time for the video, I can show it later yeah. and share it with you, but you see here uh, WaterGen as well in La Estrella, Chile. Um, all of this is to say that we have already begun and executed on many really fantastic projects in order to bring clean drinking water to all who need it, both in Latin America and Caribbean and the Caribbean and around the world. WaterGen is currently present in more than 60 countries around the world, uh, providing clean drinking water in times of emergency, in times of routine, in homes, small scale and large scale. So Thank it's you. my pleasure to present with you today. And I hope that we can, and I look forward to working uh, with you in the future in order to bring clean drinking water uh, to every human being who needs it in Latin America and Caribbean. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Zach. And thank you all for the very interesting presentations. Just to answer a question, yes, we're recording this and everyone um, that was participating will receive, uh, could receive the recording. Um, we have really four minutes for questions. So let me let me address a few. Um, I guess this is for um, IOSight. Um, how long does it take to implement the monitoring system? So if you can answer that in, in a minute. Yeah, absolutely. So a typical project takes, um, let's say a few weeks. Uh, just the example I gave, uh, that we did during COVID-19. We started a project um, in, um, during, during the pandemic. It took about, I would say, two to three months to have it up and running. Now we're like doing training and things like that. So, and that's like under these conditions. So uh, if there's algorithm development involved, then maybe it needs some more time afterwards to calibrate the algorithm and improve it. But that's more or less the time frame. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Guy. Um, another question, um, this is for Sopi. Um, what is usually the cost of, you know, of the equipment, if you can tell us more or less? 
Um, so the cost range is between $2,400 to $3,500, and that's an annual cost. Basically, it's a lease system. Um, so you pay for the service, and the service includes uh, any type of reagent, uh, the soap, the service, the data dashboard, um, and, and anything, if anything malfunctions, it's our responsibility to make sure that you keep going um, as smoothly as possible. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, another question for, um, for Ido, um, Kando. Um, so in terms, you, you gave, um, how, can you give us a little bit of an explanation? How long does it take to install your system? Um, <clears throat> so um, once, once we have the, uh, the, the laboratory capabilities, uh, and once we have a local partner in the in 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 specific uh, country, um, it will take us uh, one week to to do the um, uh, wastewater network analysis and start implementation. So um, we actually can uh, start delivering uh, results uh, within uh, first days from. Uh, for model and again but again it's uh, uh, the condition is that we have laboratory uh, capabilities and uh, and the local partner that doing the all the uh, boots on ground in the in the country so could you give uh, maybe a word of what type of partner you you'd be looking so, for so uh, currently we have uh, around 30 uh, uh, local partners around the world um, and the uh, local partner is a company that um, uh, uh, has have experience uh, in uh, doing wastewater monitoring uh, in every in every country in the world there are players um, and there are local companies that uh, has have those capabilities. Um, in the countries that we are working in, we have uh, uh, we we always have at least one partner uh, that uh, doing the service. Okay, uh, the last question for Wadegen. Um, so, in terms of the energy source um, to 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 create the water, is it a solar option? Um, is there off-the-grid options? Um, can you touch upon that, but uh, for one minute, thank you. Sure. So all we need is a power source, right? We don't need any water infrastructure of any kind. And as long as we have a power source, we don't not mind what type it is. So it can be on the actual electrical grid. It can be solar. Um, and it can also be generator, for example, for a mobile solution, as you saw in that picture from South Africa, it's actually on the back of a sort of mobile trailer, our unit a generator and a dispenser. And so not only do you have drinking water from the air, but you have a drinking water from air creation unit on the go. And I see a question here regarding maintenance. Uh, the maintenance is very simple and easy. It can be done by local people um, in the given geography. So as you can imagine, we're working around the world. We have uh, a technical team that's supporting all of our customers around the world, but we're training people uh, and the maintenance is very simple and easy. Okay, perfect. Thank you all very, very much. In the couple of uh, last minutes, uh, I would like to introduce the, Mr. Sergio Campos, the Chief of the Water and Sanitation Division in the IDB to launch our open call. Go ahead, Sergio. Thank you very much, Hila. Uh, shalom, everybody. What a great team of experts we had in, uh, in our house today. Thank you very much to all of you for presenting such uh, wonderful innovations that are all relevant uh, for the COVID pandemic that is facing us, not only in terms of bringing a solution, but the, the, how quickly they can be implemented and how relevant they can, they can be from tracing the COVID through the, through the wastewater to having better hand washing, to being able to provide our uh, uh, workers with the facility to work from home and not to expose themselves or their families to, 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 to the COVID, uh, to bringing water to lo localities or, or places where there is water, because Latin America, we have plenty of water, but we don't have access to water and sanitation. So 
I would like first to start by echoing Ana Maria's uh, remarks in terms of uh, the admiration for the spirit of the Israeli people, as well as for their government uh, in the way they support in this ecosystem, uh, which has enabled them to flourish. Uh, as you all know, the pandemic today has, is underscoring the importance of uh, water, sanitation, and health, uh, as uh, hand washing is worldwide the most recommended measure to, to fight the virus, the virus, but not everybody has water. In Latin America, for example, there's more than 200 million people that not, don't have access to, to safe water or to drinkable water. And in sanitation, more than two thirds of the Latin American population, that's more than 450 million people, don't have adequate slash management. But in this new normal, uh, our old problems still persist. Our infrastructure is uh, obsolete, uh, while Israel is treating uh, as Ifat mentioned, 3% of the, is, has a 3% non-revenue water loss. In Latin America, we have more than 50%. Uh, uh, we had difficulty in having a rapid response to COVID. We did it, but, uh, but it, uh, we learned that our uh, digitalization is not very good. That our commercial systems are not up to speed and that our workers will not be able to work from home as, the, as, as they should have. Uh, so the question is what to do. Uh, and according to our research, uh, uh, if we continue working business as usual, th this is investing the same amount we're investing and investing in the same type of infrastructure that we've been investing, it's going to take us a uh, hundred years to do it if we continue working at the same rate we've been working over the last 10 years. And it's going to take more than $15 billion per year to do it. So it's a lot of money and it's a lot of time. And as we know, the SDG 6 is crucial for all the developmental agenda, uh, particularly with, for health, uh, for education, for poverty reduction, and for gender equality. If you don't have water, uh, most likely your health is not going to be so good. If your health is not, not going to be so good, your education won't be as well. You will definitely uh, are not going to be able to leave uh, poverty. And uh, as women are the most responsible for bringing water to the house or the management of water, it's going to be difficult to address gender equality. So then the question is not only what to do, but how to do it. Uh, and in the bank for us, the, the answer to that question or, or the beacon of hope to be able to reach the SDGs is innovation. We think that as it was demonstrated by these four innovations and many others that we were able to witness in the trip that we took to Israel, and through innovation, we can do things cheaper, we can do things faster, we can escalate them, we can measure them, uh, and we can address uh, the problems that we have in an integrated manner. Um, so this is uh, an opportunity that we have to make a stand in innovation, uh, try to assist our, our governments, our utilities to embrace innovation. Uh, and that is why is the last year we launched uh, our first edition of Ideas in Action, uh, Ideas in Motion, Ideas in, in Action. Uh, our innovation prize uh, for utilities, uh, we were given an award to, in, to, to, to utilities that uh, were able to show us uh, how were they innovated. We were very successful in the call. Um, many utilities want to innovate, many utilities are innovated. innovating. We launched this, uh, this context in Guayaquil. Uh, it was very successful. But now, uh, thanks to the Israeli government and this is Israeli support, we're ready to launch challenge, challenges looking for solutions. In collaboration with the Israeli government, we have an open call for challenges faced by water and sanitation utilities who are looking to develop pilot projects to address the needs. In this category, we were going to be offering the implementation of pilot projects that are going to be focusing in solving particular challenges, technical assistance. We're gonna provide consultancies for feasibility and feasibility st studies as the price. Uh, the idea behind this collaboration is matching the needs of the region, the different needs that utilities can have, either from the commercial area, from the technical area, from the non-revenue water, from a collection of, of waste, from desalinization, uh, from, from reuse, or from others. We want the utilities to present us with their challenges, with their difficulties, with the things that they are facing that with the technology that they have cannot address. And we're gonna uh, bring uh, Israeli innovators so that they can look at these challenges and that they can offer us their best solution 
uh, to be able to do it. Uh, we believe that this is going to be a very important uh, way of mainstreaming innovation in public utilities. Uh, and um, uh, the official launch of this uh, call to open call is going to be on July the 2nd, next week. So please stay tuned and watch our social networks uh, for, the, for, for the call to action. Uh, and without any further delay, I would like to close the event. Uh, uh, on behalf of Agustina Guerri, our general manager, uh, I want to thank the Israeli government, the Ministry of Economy, uh, IFAD, thank you very much for your participation, the Innovation Authority, TAV, thank you very much for your, for your wonderful presentation, for bringing us uh, the Innovation Authority, the scope and the, and the strength of the collaboration that, that, that is possible, and Yoav, uh, thank you very much for hosting this uh, the, the seminar and for uh, expanding the areas of cooperation and innovation uh, at the back, not only in water and sanitation, but in, in so many other se sectors. So, uh, and to everybody that, ha that has joined this, this webinar, uh, we recorded the session. Uh, the four presentations were wonderful, very relevant. We're going to uh, show it to many of our clients in Latin America. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>